effect of it is just. Yeah. Yeah. Communion. <laughs> he's, he's talking about colonoscopy, and you asked him if he got his juice cup. Yeah, no. Well, good morning. It's time to w say hello to the online audience at Calvary Community Church. So we'll welcome you all in the auditorium and online. The ladies' class down the hall is very well attended this morning. You, you're welcome to come here. When I came in this morning to this auditorium, I was pleased and um, Notice something that looked just right, and yet it was different, and that is in every pew there's, there's hymnals and Bibles again, and uh, the track racks full of tracks. For those of you that are interested, the offering envelopes are in too. <laughs> not that we emphasize that. I guess I did emphasize that last week, but that's not usual. We'll start this morning over here where we left off last week, kind of, Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, and we'll get to it in just a minute. But I want to give you a general, I guess, hermeneutic principle, how to interpret the Bible principle first. There's a difference in the Bible between principles and instructions. Principles you can find from one end of the book to the other, and when you realize that's a true principle, why well, you can bank on it, you can live your life according to it, the results will be in accordance with what the Bible says will happen. A, an example of a principle is, what a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's not just in Galatians, that's actually found in the Proverbs and through and through, that you're going to receive like what you plant, and you're going to get more of it, and the same kind of it, and later than when you planted. There's a lot of principles about sowing and reaping. On the other hand, instructions, you, when you see instructions in the Bible, you need to look and see, who is this for? Who is this instruction written to specifically? Is this for me? Am I supposed to, for instance, make a, a tent and tables of wood and overlay them with gold and, and an altar and a lampstand? And uh, am I supposed to come to the place of the tabernacle four, three times a year, or is it four times a year, and give a tithe to the Levites and redeem all my firstborn? Is this all, in, it's certainly instructions that are in the Bible, but is it instructions for me? I may be able to glean principles from those instructions because they are pictures of things that are eternal truths. God told Moses to make everything that he made according to the pattern that he showed him when he was with him on the mountain. So Moses saw real things in heaven like what God had him make for the children of Israel to have in front of them. So there's principles there, but the instructions are very specifically for Moses and the Levites and especially the children, Aaron and his children, the high priest and their line. Those are instructions not for Bob. And there's lots of instructions in the Bible not for Bob. When we go to looking at a passage of prophetic truth, truth that looks into the future, sometimes in that passage we'll find instructions. But we really have to think through the primary application of the passage to know whether those instructions apply to us. In Luke 21, it's a passage like those in the last few chapters of Matthew that Jesus talks about his return again and how the disciples were to behave. And for instance, in verse 14, he says, Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your, your adversaries will not be able to gainsay nor resist. Now, I know some students that have taken that as a verse to use in Bible college. Not a good plan. <laughs> <clears throat> they should actually meditate before what they should answer when they come to exam time. They really should, and so should we. And as regarding giving answers to people that would persecute us, or he's talking about a testimony here in verse 13, settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer. I think it's better as a general principle that we study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
that we consecrate the Lord God in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that's in us with meekness and fear. These things require premeditation and work and study. These are not the instructions to the people of the tribulation period who will be newly saved. Nobody goes into the tribulation already a Bible college graduate that's saved. Maybe some lost Bible college graduates go into the tribulation and get saved. But the bulk of those 144,000 witnessing Jewish believers are new babies in Christ, and they got to grow up fast. And for them, when they are delivered up to the synagogues and prisons and brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, they have a promise from God here that they don't have to pre prepare ahead of time how to give their answer. They'll be giving them an answer. So we need to look carefully at who, it's, who the instructions are to if we want to thoroughly understand any passage of Scripture. Tom, can I ask you a question? I know that was one, right? Uh, do, you, uh, do you have an allergy to almonds or nuts or anything? No. Okay. Well, I think there's brownies or something on your Bible, and they have nuts on them, and I wasn't sure if you could have them or not. So Somebody was kind to you and brought you some sweets. All right, well, let us, let us pray after that bit of instruction and, and get started. Father in heaven, as we open your word this morning, help us to be wise and understanding. And as we learn, help us to be re faithful to work at remembering what we've learned and letting it change our lives as we go out and do what we have been instructed to do and live our lives obedient to the instructions that are for us and in accord with the principles from your word that are for everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, I, I haven't unblanked the screen yet for the auditorium. Here's, here's uh, the scripture that I'm at. It's a chap chapter before where we were just at. At the end of chapter 20 in verse 47, Jesus said to beware of these scribes, and then he said, which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers. And I was just, I remind you that he was fussing at him for making a show. And then in the next four verses, which we did go over last week, he said some of those people, they, they rip off widows. And he said, this poor widow is cast in more than they did. They all, and he had to call his disciples back to him to tell them that because they kind of ducked and dodged when he was yelling at the, the Pharisees and the scribes. Well, so the disciples are with him again. He's there beside the treasury where he watched the poor widow turn in her two mites. And the disciples are in the temple and they're looking. It's as some, verse 5, as some spake of the temple. This, by the way, if you're using a Schofield Bible, is on page 1105. As some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. What are they doing? Staring at the stones. Why are they staring at the stones? I thought I'd read something to you. It was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. This, the Jews give very great encomiums, I don't know what that word means, <laughs> tributes, plaudits, of the second temple as repaired by Herod. And it was undoubtedly a very stru fine structure. They said that he built the house of the sanctuary, an exceeding beautiful building, that he repaired the temple in beauty greatly exceeding that of Solomon's. Now that's saying something. They moreover observed that he who has not seen a building of Herod has never seen a beautiful building. Wow. With what was it built? With stones of green and white marble. Others say that it was built with stones of spotted green and white marble. These very likely were the very stones the disciples pointed to and admired and were of a prodigious size as well as of worth. Some of the stones were, as Josephus says, 45 cubits long, 5 cubits high, and 6 broad. 45, let's say 15 to 18 inches. Let's just say 15. So we're talking about 60 feet long. I don't know. Maybe, yeah, maybe not quite 50 feet long and uh, 9 feet, uh, 
eight feet wide, six feet high, has a big stone. Any stone that's 50 feet long is, is a mountain, not a stone, but they cut these things out and brought them there. They were finished stones. Others of them, Josephus says, were 25 cubits long, eight high, and 12 wide. And there, he says in the same place, in the porches, four rows of pillars. The thickness of each pillar was as much as three men with their arms stretched out and joined together could grasp. Ooh. The length, 27 feet, the number of them, 162. 162 of these pillars that size, a miracle. To be and beautiful to a miracle. At the size of these stones and the beauty of their work, it is said that Titus, the Roman conqueror, later emperor, was astonished when he destroyed the temple, at which time his soldiers plundered it and took away the gifts with which it was also said to be adorned. These were rich and valuable things that were dedicated to it and either laid up in it or hung upon the walls and pillars of it, as was usual in other temples. These may intend the golden table given by Pompey and the spoils which Herod dedicated, particularly the golden vine, which was a gift of his, besides multitudes of other valuable things which were greatly enriching and ornamental to it. Now the disciples suggest by observing these what a pity it was such a grand edifice should be destroyed, how unaccountable it was that a place of such strength could be easily demolished. Another commentator more briefly says, these stones were white and strong, 50 feet long, 24 broad, 16 feet thick. If this account can be relied upon, well might the disciples be struck with wonder at such a superb edifice and formed by such immense stones. So that's why Luke says, the disciples, some of them, they are talking about the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. It was astonishing. It was amazing. It was wonderful. And Jesus said, verse 6, As for these things which you behold, what you looking at, you know? The days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down what an amazing thing to say. The guys throw, thrown down? I don't understand how they were thrown up. How could they be thrown down? You know? They asked him, saying, Master, when? When shall these things be? What sign will there be when these things shall come? What sign? They asked him two questions. When? What sign? They like us. We want it. When Lord, when are you gonna come back? When, 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 when? Can't we know when? Well, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he says the Jews require a sign. They always wanted a sign. Verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 1 says, After that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Couldn't get it by wisdom. The Jews require a sign. They want a sign. We're going to look at some of the places in the Gospels where they came to Jesus and said, what sign do you show? The Greeks seek after wisdom, but the answer to both is Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Sometimes people will criticize things that need not be criticized. The promise of Jesus that's the bottom line of getting saved is, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. But the most persuasive argument to bring someone to where they're ready to believe in him is that he died for sins and rose again. Those two points are what most persuade people to believe in Jesus. People aren't saved by believing doctrinal statements. They're saved when they trust the Savior. He that, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He that believeth in the name of the Son of God, you that believe in the name of the Son of God, you may know that you have eternal life. The bottom line is believe in the Son of God or believe in the name of the Son of God. Receive him, that is, believe in his name. But 
to omit the reasons that make that make sense is foolish. Whatever culture you're in around the world, Jew or Gentile, Chinese or African, the story of Jesus is the story of the perfect substitute God sent to earth that went not just through three years of perfect teaching, but went to the cross as a lamb, a substitute to pay not just for the sins of those that were around him there, but for all mankind from Adam down to the last person that will ever be conceived. He paid for our sins, for all of our sins. He is, First John says, the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, here's the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. If you know how to bring two people that are at odds back together and you don't tell them they're still not together and you failed in the ministry of reconciliation God and man have something separating them historically called sin but reconciliation has been done by God he took the sin out of the way he paid for it on his own son's body on the cross and we have that story of reconciliation. This ministry of reconciliation means we need to serve it up so that people will know sin's been forgiven and they can have the righteousness of Jesus Christ put to their account just by trusting in him. 2 Corinthians 5, a few verses later, says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That is what one of the teachers called the great exchange that's what we illustrate when we do the wallet illustration here we are with a mouse on us <laughs> with sin on us but jesus took the sin paid for it came back from the dead and says whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life he covers us up with his perfect righteousness he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of god in him so clear so the sign is not what we need anymore that's what the jews needed to know who the messiah was and wisdom is not you're not going to argue people into salvation we should have reasonable answers peter says but it's not the way to go but the jews require a sign in john chapter 2 it's recorded the jews said to him after he'd cleaned out the temple the first time Get out of here. Don't make my father's house a house of merchandise. This is no shopping mall. This is the temple. The Jews said, What sign showest thou us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and three days I'll raise it up. And they said, Say what? Don't you see these stones? You can't move a stone like that. The Jews said, Forty and six years was this temple in building. They're counting Herod's improvements to it. And it had been going on and still was going on in their day. Forty and six years was this temple in building. You're going to rear it up in three days? They didn't get it, but he spake of the temple of his body. Look what John says here. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. Praise the Holy Spirit coming in and teaching him, right? That was what Jesus promised. They'll bring everything to his rem their remembrance, whatsoever he had taught them. They remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the Scripture... Psalm 16 says he'll rise from the dead. And the word which Jesus had said. Now, I'm not going to quit. It's not part of the message. But when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Do you think those people believed that Jesus died on the cross to pay for their sins? No. They didn't know that yet. They might have understood them, that he was the Messiah and they could have identified him with Isaiah 53 and thought that through, but it hadn't happened yet. But they believed in him, believed in his name because they saw the miracles that he did. He was the promised one and they believed in him. Is that enough to be saved? Uh-huh. In the very next chapter, just a few verses down the road, Nicodemus comes to him and says, well, what a great teacher you are because nobody can do these things 
that you do except God be with him. And Jesus said, you need to be born again, Nicodemus. And then he gives him John 3.16. Did Nicodemus get saved? I think so. Either before or after that. He could have been one of these saved right here that believed in his name because they saw the miracles he did. Nicodemus referred to the miracles that he did. Saved without knowledge, perhaps, of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Well, you got to believe it now. Who says? <laughs> it's the most persuasive argument to make your mind ready to believe in Jesus. But the bottom line is, believe in his name. Believe in him. So it goes. Well, let's look at the, another place where they demanded a sign. They said, give us a sign. John chapter 6 this, you have to understand the context. John chapter 6 is after he fed the multitude over there on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And then he said, let's get out. He prayed all night and then went across the lake and got to the other side. And the people that were over there that got fed chase him down. They get in boats and they come on over. <laughs> when they had found him, verse 25 says, when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when did you get here? <laughs> and Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. He says, you're not here for more teaching, you're here for more fish sandwiches. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of God has, shall give unto you. Him hath God the Father sealed. He says, believe in me, me, get something that's eternal from me. The Son of Man will give it unto you. They said, well, what are we supposed to do to work the works of God? He said, you want to work the works of God? Believe on him whom he has sent. And then they said the question again. They said, therefore, unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What do you work? We got a suggestion, verse 31, our fathers did eat manna in the desert. It's written, he gave them bread to eat. We suggest fish sandwiches. <laughs> Jesus is not happy with and not, not amused. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. My Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And they said, Okay, let's have some more fish sandwiches. <laughs> you better pay attention, boys. I am the bread of life. I am. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. I say, you've seen me, and you believe not. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. Him that cometh to me I'll in no wise cast out. This is the Father's will which has sent me. All that he's given me I'll lose nothing, raise it to the last day. This is his will, verse 40. Everyone that sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. I'll raise him at the last day. And they said, no fish sandwiches? <laughs> they murmured at him. Because he said, I'm the bread. And they said, this is Jesus. Joseph's boy. We know his father and mother. They were wrong. But that's what they said. How is it then he said, I came down from heaven. And he goes on and, and it gets worse, if you will, from their perspective, their unbelieving perspective. Focusing on the flesh, he said, you need to eat my flesh. You need to drink my blood. My flesh is meat, is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And at the end of the chapter, many of them go away. And he looks at the disciples and says, you going to go away too? And they answer him, you're the one that's got the words of everlasting life. And he says, by the way, it's not the flesh. It's not the flesh. It's the Spirit, verse 63, that makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And there's some among you that believe not because Judas was there in that group at that time. So there's the Jews asking for a sign. The most, I suppose, noteworthy sign is recorded in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, that's the next one. Certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. 
He said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And Jonas was a good example of a bad example. But he says that's the sign. As Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah's body stayed in that whale for three days and three nights. Where did his soul and spirit go? Place of the dead, the heart of the earth. He was out of the belly of Sheol, it says. He lifted his prayer up. And then God brought him back to finish the work he'd been given. Jesus' body was in a tomb for, we say, three days and three nights. That's what it says right there. Tell him a quibble. I'm not going to worry about it. And then he got back up. He got back up. And he goes on with the story of Jonas just a little bit, but he says, here's the sign, boys. I'm going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It's really the same as the sign he gave back in John chapter 2, isn't it? Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews require a sign. Wow. The disciples said, what sign will there be when these things come to pass? Back at the beginning of the chapter. And he begins to tell them, sort of an answer to their questions what when will it be what sign will it be he says take heed that you be not deceived many shall come in my name saying i am christ and the time draweth near go ye not therefore with them is that the sign no that's not the sign he says that's not it don't be fooled lots of people claiming to be me are not it <laughs> back at the time of the lord in the first hundred years after his birth Josephus wrote about the Jewish war, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and all. He was a contemporary but not a believer, but his history still survives. And he wrote that there were many who, pretending to divine inspiration, deceived the people, leading out numbers of them to the desert, pretending that God would there show them the signs of liberty, meaning redemption from the Roman power. Josephus wrote that an Egyptian false prophet led 30,000 men into the desert who were almost all cut off by Felix. Uh, you notice Felix mentioned in Acts, tw in Acts 21, but it was ju a just judgment for God to deliver up that people into the hands of the false Christ who had rejected the true one. Soon after our Lord's crucifixion, Simon Magus appeared, the great one in the, little the place of Samaria where Philip went and preached. He persuaded the people of Samaria that he, Simon, was the great power of God and boasted among the Jews he was the Son of God. He got saved, but he was still a false teacher for many years. After he saved, it's in the church history, if you will, of the same stamp and character was also Dosithius, a Samaritan who pretended he was the Christ foretold by Moses. About 12 years after the death of our Lord, when Cuspius Fadus was procurator of Judea, arose an imposter by the name of Thutis, who said he was a prophet, and persuaded a great multitude to follow him with their best efforts to the river Jordan, which he promised to divide for their passage, saying these things, says Josephus, he deceived many, almost the very words of our Lord. A few years after, under the reign of Nero, while Felix was procurator of Judea, impostors of this stamp were so frequent that some of them were taken and killed almost every day. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. And the time draws near. Don't go with them. <laughs> when ye shall hear of wars, and commotions be not terrified for these things must first come to pass the end is not our king james bible says by and by um, usually i just love the king james translation in this particular case the words translated with the phrase by and by is one word that is more hundreds of times translated immediately it's the word that fills the gospel of mark because it's the immediate gospel it's not not down the road sometime, it means right now, not immediately, it is euthios. And what the end is not immediately. You're going to hear about wars, yeah, I've heard of wars, and commotions. Oh, there's so many more wars and commotions now, mustn't the end be? 
Hmm. We just got better news media than we used to have as far as getting coverage of them. I don't think that there's necessarily more as now. He says, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there'll be great earthquakes in divers places, not just underwater, by the way. Great earthquakes, lots going on, and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs there shall be from heaven. We have international troubles, geological troubles, food supply troubles, disease troubles, what? Pestilences. Oh, we've had one of those just now, haven't we? Fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Fearful sights. Phobetra. It means terrors. It's where we get the phobia word. Terrors, like those imagined by the mentally ill. Maybe even since it says fearful sights, great signs from heaven. Maybe it's talking about people that are deathly afraid of climate change. It's talking about cold. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, Jesus knew it all. Well, does that mean it's time for the end then? I mean, all that. No, well, let, what comes next? Before all these things, they're going to lay hands on you, disciples, and persecute you. And the disciples to whom he's speaking probably got a little nervous and they needed to hear my message at the beginning of the message about not every instruction is for you. Are, we're going to get to instructions that are especially applicable to the saints of what we call the tribulation period. And the disciples stand here listening to Jesus, representing those saints, but they're going to be out of here long before this all comes to pass. Before all these things, they'll lay hands on you and persecute you, up to the, deliver you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. It'll turn to you for a testimony. It fits Paul's life very well. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. I'll give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. You'll be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. Now look at the next verse says, you shall be hated of all, my my, all men for my name's sake. But look at verse 18. There shall not an hair of your head perish. What did he just say in verse 16? Some of you shall they cause to be put to death. But verse 18, there shall not an hair of your head perish. I see here a pretty plain statement from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ that physical death isn't the same as perishing. <laughs> perishing has to do with your eternal preservation. There shall not an hair of your head perish. John 3, 16, whosoever believeth him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Shall not perish. Jesus wasn't all about physical life and death. He said, he said to the sisters, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And he meant it. What he offered the woman at the well was water that would be springing up in her so she would never thirst again. It wasn't about physical life it was about eternal life there shall not a hair of your head perish what an offer what a truth the tribulation saints many many will die not all but many will die but they won't any of them perish no will any believer ever perish he says in verse 19, In your patience possess ye your souls, not your bodies. <laughs> in verse 20, he says, When you see Jerusalem compassed with armies. Oh, don't you know that people alive when he spoke those words did see that in 70 A.D. They lived another 30 years or so, 35 years. And there's the army of the Roman general Titus besieging Jerusalem, surrounding it, building a ramp, building up to the top of the wall so they could starve them out and easily take them when you see jerusalem compassed with armies then know the desolation thereof is is nigh 
And they probably took this as instruction for them in 70 AD. Let them which are in the Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out and let the, not them that are in the countries enter there. And these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And somebody listening close has probably said, wait, what do you say? All things which are written may be fulfilled. With the benefit of our historical hindsight, we look back to 70 A.D. and said, a lot of things happened in 70 A.D., and Jerusalem was taken, and the temple was destroyed. I'm not sure all things were fulfilled. Verse 23, Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Why would there be wrath on God's people? They did not believe in the Messiah that he had sent. And it will be so again in the tribulation. Why so much on his people in the tribulation? Because they, the believe, not the believers, but the Jewish people of the tribulation who are not believers, make a covenant with the Antichrist, the beast. Great wrath upon the people. And then he breaks the covenant in the midst of the seven years and begins the greatest persecution of all time of the people of Israel. Verse 24 says, They shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive unto all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In a sense, what happened in 70 A.D. was setting up the tribulation. But the final destruction of Jerusalem happens just before the Son of Man returns. Verse 25 says, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. The powers of heaven shall be shaken, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Do you get why I don't think this is 70 A.D.? <laughs> All things be fulfilled. And when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh. What a wonderful word of comfort that is for the tribulation saints who will get this book in their hands and read it and know it's now. Now he's coming. Your redemption draweth nigh. We have songs about that. We, we love to sing about it. There are three words in the New Testament translated redemption. The first word is agorazo, translated redeemed. Agorazo means to buy something in the marketplace. We like to say we're in the marketplace of sin. We're slaves to sin. It's like a slave market in the old Greek cities. They had slaves and they bought them, sold them in the market. And here's the word agorazo in Revelation 5, 9. They're singing the song to the Lamb, Jesus, in heaven about the title deed to the earth, the book, the scroll that's sealed up with it and written on both sides of it, unusual for a scroll, and say, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign in the earth. There's the word agorazo. You have redeemed us. The second word is like agorazo. It's ex agorazo. If you look over the doors leading out of this room, you'll see a word exit. It means the way out, right? Ex. It's the way to get out of here. And ex agorazo is to be bought and taken out of the market. Christ didn't just buy us. Sometimes you can go to the flea market, buy. you'll see some of the people in the booths there looking around, looking for bargains themselves, and they buy somebody else's stuff and move it down to their booth, and then they sell it and make a profit, they hope. That's still being on the market, even though they've been bought.
but Christ has ex agarazo. He redeemed us, bought us, and took us out of the market, redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, as it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, that's us, through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The last word, the third word translated redeem in the New Testament is different entirely. We had agarazzo to buy in the marketplace, ex agarazzo to buy and take out of the marketplace. And then in 1 Peter that's not the right bookmark. One nineteen. Oh, nineteen. I said it on nine by accident. First Peter one, nineteen. We'll look at eighteen. I think. There's the word. The word translated redeemed in First Peter one eighteen says is lutruo. It's a form of luo. We used to make fun of luo. Hernandez in our Greek class, because it's a word that means I release. It also means I destroy. <laughs> and so Louis was the destroyer. But uh, lutruo is to release. And 1 Peter 1.18 says, you know that you were not set free, released with corruptible things. You're bought and set free. Not with corruptible things as silver and gold from your feigned conversation received by tradition from your fathers. You're redeemed, verse 19 says, with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We are bought, freed out of this slavery of sin. We are bought and taken out of the marketplace. We can't be sold back into it again, which permanently bought and removed from this slave market, and we are set free. Not with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We are redeemed. That last verse that we read in Luke 21, Jesus said, your redemption, your redemption draweth nigh. Lift up your heads. Your redemption draws nigh. We enjoy our salvation now. We have been saved. We are being saved because day by day as we go through our lives, our Lord intercedes for us. And we shall be saved. There are three tenses to salvation. We shall be saved when we leave the very presence of sin behind. When we go to be with the Lord, and it says, when we shall see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. First John chapter 3, wonderful passage says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. The world knows us not because it knew him not, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I'm so glad what I look at in the mirror isn't what I'm going to see forever in the mirror in heaven. <laughs> I, it's not that it's... I, I'm so glad God gave me a body to work with here, but... We don't know yet what we shall be, but we know we'll be like him. Just seeing him will make us like him. And here in this lifetime, every man that has this hope, this expectation, this joyful anticipation in himself, purifies himself. You should be being more like Jesus because you know you're going to heaven. You purify yourself even as he is pure. That's, you don't want a big change when you get to heaven. You want to be able to recognize yourself in a sense. <laughs> Isn't that good? It doesn't yet appear what we shall be. We shall be like him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the instructions that were given for those that will be there when Jesus comes back. 
And thank you for the principles of how we are redeemed and how we stand before you now, but we shall stand before you and see you, and then, then we will be like you. We'll see you as you are. So many things we have to thank you for. Help us to look into the days that remain in our lives. So teach us to number our days. We may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Let us wisely use today and every day that you have left, you have left for us to work for you. If you come back today, well, the number is very low. We are all happy for that, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. The last prayer of the Bible, we echo it. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. In your name we, we pray. Amen. God bless. We're dismissed. We'll have church here in just another few minutes. Thanks for attending. Thank you.